Ashley Brooke reading Nora Roberts' book, Rising Tides, Chapter 16. There wasn't a hint of rain on the breezy summer air. The sky was hot, staggering blue, an unbroken bowl that held a faint haze and fraggle fragile clouds. A single bird sang manically as it mad to complete the song before the long day was over. She was nervous as a teenager on prom night. <laughs> the thoughts of the thought of that made Grace laugh. No teenager teenager had ever dreamed of nerves like this. She fussed with her hair, wishing she had long glossy curls like Anna's exotic gypsy like sexy, but she didn't. She reminded herself firmly and never would at least the short, simple crop showed off the pretty gold Drop earrings Julie had loaned her. Julie had been so sweet and excited about what she termed a big date. She launched straight into a what to wear and what to wear with it routine and naturally had deemed the contents of Grace's closet a total loss. Of course, letting Julie drag her off to the mall had been sheer foolishness. Not that Julie had to yank very hard. Grace admitted it had been so long since she'd shopped simply for the simple pleasure of shopping. For the couple hours they spent swarming through the shop, she felt so young and carefree. As if nothing was really more important than finding the right outfit. Still, she'd had no business buying a new dress even if she did get it on sale, but she couldn't seem to talk herself out of it. Just this one little indulgence this one little luxury she so desperately wanted something new and fresh for this special night she yearned for the sexy sophisticated black with its shoe string stripes and snug skirt or the boldly sensuous red with the daringly plunging neckline but they hadn't suited her as she known they wouldn't it had been no surprise that the simple powder blue linen <laughs> had been discounted. It had looked so plain, so ordinary, hanging on the rack, but Julie had pressed it on her, and Julie had an eye for such things. She'd been right, of course, Grace thought. Now, it was simple, almost virginal, and its adorning bodice and graceful lines, but it looked pretty on, with the collar cool against her skin and the skirt floating around her legs. Grace traced a finger over the square neckline, faintly amazed that the brawl Julie had nagged her into buying actually did give through with a hint of cleavage. A miracle indeed, Grace thought with a little laugh. Concentrating, she leaned close to the mirror. She'd done everything Julie had instructed with uh, borrowed makeup, and her eyes did look bigger and deeper. She decided she'd done her best to blot away the signs of fatigue and thought she had succeeded. Maybe she hadn't managed more than a week of sleep the night before, but she didn't feel in the least tired. She felt energized. She reached out, and her hand hovered over the samples of perfume that had been given at the cosmetic counter. Then she remembered that Anna had told her to wear her own scent for Ethan before, that it would say something to him. Choosing that instead, she closed her eyes and dabbed it on. With her eyes closed, imagining that his lips might brush here, brush there, <laughs> like a taste where her pulse beat that fragrance into her life. Still dreaming, she picked up a little ivory evening bag, another loan, checked its contents. She hadn't carried such a small purse since, well, before Aubrey was born, she thought. So odd to look inside and see none of the dozens of mother things she was used to carrying. Only women things now, she mused. A little compact, she splurged on a tube of lipstick. She rarely thought to use her house key, a few carefully folded bills, and a tissue that wasn't thin and ragged from wiping a sticky face. <laughs> It made her feel fitamin just to look at it, to slip her feet into it, and part practically healed sandals. Oh, she'd been scrambled to pay off her charge card when the bill came, turn in front of the mirror and watch her skirt follow the movement. When she heard his truck pull up outside, she dashed across the room, made herself stop. No, she wasn't going to race the door like an eager puppy. She would wait right in here until he knocked and give her heart a chance to beat normally again. When he did knock, it was still thundering in her eyes, but she stepped out, smiled at him through the screen, and moved toward the door. He remembered watching her walk to the door like this before on the night they made love for the first time. She looked so lovely, so lonely, the candlelight flickering around her. But tonight she looked. He didn't think he had words, words for her. Everything about her seemed to glow. Skin, hair, eyes. It made him feel awkward, humble, reverent. He wanted to kiss her to be certain she was real, and yet was afraid to touch. He stepped back as she opened the screen, then took the hand she held out carefully. He looked different. No, it wasn't poetry that made her smile. I wanted to. She pulled the door closed behind her and let him lead her to his truck. He wished immediately that he drove the Veta. <laughs> The truck doesn't suit that dress, he said as she climbed in. 
It suits me. She swept her skirts and skirts in to be certain they didn't catch you in the door. It may look different, but I'm still the same. She settled back and prepared for the most beautiful evening of her life. The sun was still up and bright when they arrived in Princess Anne. The restaurant he chosen was in one of the old refurbished houses where the ceilings were high, the windows tall and narrow, candles yet to be lit. Lidded stood on tables draped in white linen, and the waiters wore jackets and formal black ties. Conversations from other diners were muted, as in church you could hear her heels click on the polished floor as they were led to their table. She wanted to remember every detail, the way the little table sat snug by the window, the painting of the bay that hung on the wall behind Ethan, the frink friendly twinkle in the waiter's eyes when he offered them menus and asked if they liked cocktails, but most of all she wanted to remember... Wanted to remember Ethan, the quiet smile in his eyes when he looked across the table at her, the way his fingertips continued to brush hers on the white linen. Would you like some wine? <laughs> yes, sir. Wine? Candles? Flowers? Yes. That would be nice. He opened the wine list. <laughs> Topley. He knew she preferred whites. And one or two of the types were familiar. Philip always kept a couple bottles chilling. Though God knew why any reasonable man made that much money on a regular basis for a drink. Grateful that the selections were numbered and he wouldn't have to attempt to pronounce any French, he gave the waiter the order privately. Please, when he saw his choice, met with approval. Hungry? A little. She wondered if she'd been able to swallow a crumb around the light in her mouth. In her throat. It's just so nice to be like this with you. I should have taken you out before. This is perfect. There hasn't been much time for this. We can juggle some time. And it wasn't so bad. He discovered wearing a tie, eating in a place around by other people. Now when he got to look at her across the table, he looked rested, Grace. That's it, look, but without making her smile, well, certainly. Then her fingers squeezed his face. Oh, Ethan, I do love you. The sun dipped lower and the candles were lit. Lighted as they sipped wine and enjoyed a perfectly prepared meal served with flair. He told her about the progress of the boat and of the new contract bill. Have finessed. That's wonderful. It's hard to believe you only started the business this spring. I thought about it for a long time, he told her. Had a lot of the details worked out in my head. <laughs> he would have, of course, he thought. Taking things through was innate with Ethan. Even so, you're making it work. Really making it work. I've thought about coming by dozens of times. Why haven't you? Before... If I saw you too often or in too many different places, it worried me. <laughs> she loved being able to tell why well, she's eyes changed when she say she did. I was sure you'd be able to see the way I felt about you, how I wanted to touch you and have you touch me. The blood homed in his fingertips as the gazes, as they grazed hers, <laughs> and his eyes did change just this morning, deepen as they stared in her. I talked myself out of you, <laughs> he said carefully. I'm glad it didn't stick. So am I. He brought her fingers over, touched his lips to them. Maybe you'll come by the boatyard one of these days, and I'll look at you. And I'll see. She hung her head. Maybe I will. You could drop in some hot afternoon in his thumb cruise. So his thumb cruise Leslie over and I'll bring fried chicken. <laughs> her laugh was quick and easy. I should have figured that what really attracted you to me. Yeah, it tipped the scales. A pretty face, sea goddess eyes, long legs, warm laugh. They don't mean much to a man. But you had a nice batch of southern fried chicken, and you've got something. <laughs> Delightfully flattered, she shook her head. And here I was thinking I wouldn't get any poetry out of you. His gaze skipped it, skimmed over her face, and for the first time in his life, he wished he had a talent for composing Owens. Do you want poetry, Grace? I want you, Ethan, just the way you are. With a long content sigh, she looked around the restaurant. And you had an evening like this now and then? She left her gaze back to him again. And you'll get, and you got something. Sounds like a deal. Since I like being out with you like this, I like being anywhere with you. She grew her fingers in his. Long time ago. Seems like a long time. <laughs> I used to dream about romance, so I hoped it would be one day. This is better, Ethan. Real turned out to be better than the dream. I don't want you to be happy. If I was any happier, I'd have the two people. I'd have two people for it all to fit. Her eyes sparkled with laugh as she leaned over. And then you'd have to figure out what to do with two of me. <laughs> One's all I need. Do you want to take a walk? The right side. Of it. Would it be now? Yes, I think a walk would be perfect. The sun was nearly gone as they strolled along the pretty streets casting shadows lovely and deep in a sky dazzled by hot color the moon 
was starting its rise. It wouldn't be a fool, Grace noted, but it didn't matter. Her heart was. When he turned her into his arms, just at the edge of the splash of light from a street lamp, she muddled into the long, slow kiss. Different, Ethan thought again as he let himself take the kiss just a shade deeper. She felt softer, warmer, yielding against him, though he could feel faint tremors. Revelling her. I love you, Grace, he said it to soothe both of them. Her heart bounded straight into her throat, making her voice shaky. Stars were blinking to life overhead, brilliant white points of light. I love you too, Ethan. She closed her eyes, held her breath, anticipation of the words. We better start back. <laughs> she blinked her eyes open. Oh, yes. <laughs> Let out her breath. Yes, you're right. Foolish at first, she decided as they walked back to the truck. A man, as careful and thorough as Ethan, one proposed to her on a street corner in Princess Anne. He would wait until they got back, until Julia had gone home and Aubrey had been checked on. He'd wait until they were alone, private, in familiar surroundings. Of course, that was it. So she beamed a smile at him, starting the engine. It was a wonderful dinner, Ethan. There was moonlight, just as she imagined. It slanted through the window and slipped gently over Aubrey in her crib. Her baby dreamed happy dreams, she thought, and how much happier they would all be in the morning when they'd taken the next step toward becoming a family. Bobby already loved him. Grace thought as she shook her daughter's hair just a short time ago, she was resolved to raise her child alone to make certain that she was enough. All that was changing now. Ethan would be a father to her daughter, a loving parent who would watch over her. One day they took Aubrey in together. One day they would stand over her crib watching another child sleep. With Ethan, she could share the joy of simple moment like that. That quiet moment in the moon washed dark when you looked in and saw your child sleeping safe. There was so much he could give them, she thought, and that she could give to him. A man like Ethan, she knew, would fill the that first flutter of life in his heart just as she would feel it in her womb they could share that in a lifetime of simple moments she moved quietly into the living room and saw ethan standing gazing through the screen door trying to notice of a panic he wasn't going he couldn't be leaving not now not before do you want some coffee she asked him quickly her voice rising before she could join no thanks he turned she's sleeping all right uh yes he's fine she looks so much like you do you think? Especially when she smiles. Grace. He watched her eyes fix on his, glow in the low light of the lamp for a moment. It seemed to him that nothing had come before, nothing would come after. Could be the three of them there together on quiet nights, just like this in the little dollhouse. It could be his future. He wanted to believe it could be his future. I'd like to say, I'd like to be with you tonight, if you want. I want, of course, I want. She thought she understood he needed to show her love first. More than Willie, she had on him. Come to bed, Ethan. He took care to be tender to stroke her gently to peek, holding her there, holding until her body bowed. A trembling bridge of sensation to make her float and sigh. He watched the moonlight dample his skin, followed in shifting shadows with his fingertips, with his lips, pleasured her. Love surrounding her, created alert, rocked her with a rhythm as gentle as a quiet sea, gliding on. She offered it back to him, a shimmering reflection. His tenderness moved hers to tears. She knew how that his needs could be ripping raw and reckless, and that thrilled her. Yet this part of him, this compassionate sensation, sensitive and most generous part of him, touched her heart at the core. She felt fathoms deeper into the wide well of love. When he slipped into her, when they were joined, his mouth moved over hers to capture each sigh. She glided up, trembled on the silk-covered peak, holding, holding until he was trembling with her, and they could catch each other on the slow tumble down. After he shifted her so that she curled into the curve of his arm and stroked her, her eyes grew heavy. Now, she thought, as she began to drip, he would ask her now, while they both still glowing. Waiting, she slid into sleep. He was ten. The last beating she'd given him had left his back a maze of purple and bruise and scarlet pain. She never hit him in the face. She learned quickly that most clients didn't care to see black eyes and bloody lips on the merchandise. She stopped using her fists, mostly. She found a belt or a hairbrush more effective. She liked the thin, circling br brushes that were all hard bristles. The first time she'd used one on him, the shock and pain had been so unspeakable that he fought back and had been her lip that he had been bloodied. She used her fist then until he found escape in unconsciousness. He was no match for her, and he knew it. She was a big woman and strong with it. When she was drunk, she was stronger yet and more ruthless. Didn't help to plead. Didn't help to cry, so he stopped doing both. The beatings weren't as bad as the other. Nothing was. She got $20 for him the first time she sold him. 
He knew because she told him and promised to give him two dollars for himself if he didn't make a fuss about it. He hadn't known what else she was talking about. Not then he hadn't known, not till she let him in the dark bedroom with the man. Even then he didn't know, didn't understand, what those big damp hands were on him, and fear was so blindly bright, the shame so dark, the terror so loud, as loud as his screams. He screamed until nothing could crawl through his throat but a guilt and whimper. Even the pain of being raped couldn't push more out of him. She even gave him the two dollars. He burned it. Then in the dirty sink in the horrible bathroom, that stank of his own vomit, he watched the money curl up black. And his hate for her was just as black. He promised himself, staring at his own hollow eyes in the spotted mirror, that if she ever whored him again, he would kill her. Ethan, her heart tripped in her throat. Ray scrambled on her knees, his shaky shoulders, scanned under her hands, was like ice. His body was rigid as stone, but trembling. Made her think wildly of earthquakes, volcanoes, pulling violence under a hard layer of rock. Sound he made awaken her. They made her dream of an animal kind of trap. His eyes flew open. She could see only the glint of them in the dark, but they looked blind and wild. For a moment, she was afraid that the boiling violence she sensed would break through and batter her. You were having a dream, she said it firmly, certain that that was what was needed to put Ethan back into those staring eyes. It's all right now. It was a dream. He could hear his breathing raspy, more than a dream he knew. It had been a cold, sweated flashback he hadn't had in years, but the result was the same. Now she curled sickly in his stomach. His head pounded and swarmed with the patience echoed of a young boy scream. She uttered once, violently, until the gentle hands were on his I'm okay. But his voice was rough, and she knew he lied. I'm getting you some water. No, I'm okay. Not even water would settle when it's jumping so Go back to sleep. Ethan, you're shaking. He would stop it. He could stop it. It would only take a little time. It's concentration. So that her eyes were huge, more than a little frightened. It was both sick and furious that he had brought even the memory of the horror to her bed. Dear God, had he let himself believe for even an instant that it could be different for him. For them, he forced himself smile. She just spoke to me, that's all. Sorry I woke you. Reassured because she saw a shadow of the man she left come back into his eyes, she shrugged his head. Must have been awful. Scared both of us. Must have been. Don't remember. The next slide, he thought. A bomb anyway. Come on, lie back down. Everything's all right now. She snuggled up beside him, hoping to comfort. Laid a hand over his heart. Still raised. Just close your eyes, she murmured as she would have thought. Close your eyes and rest now. Hold on to me, Ethan. Dream of me. Praying for peace. He did both. When she woke to find him gone, Grace tried to tell herself that that weight of her disappointment was out of pro portion. He hadn't wanted to disturb her so early, so he hadn't said goodbye. Now that the sun was up, he would already be out on the water. She rose, slipped on a robe, and padded in to make coffee and to grab those few minutes of alone time before Abby rose. Then she sighed and stepped out of her little back porch. She knew her disappointment didn't stem from finding him up and gone when she woke. She'd been sure, so sure he was going to ask her to marry him. All the signs had been there, the scene set, the moment perfect, but the words hadn't come. She'd all but written the script, she thought with a grimace, and he hadn't followed it. This morning was supposed to begin the next phase of their lives. She imagined running over to Julie and sharing the joy of it, calling Anna and babbling, begging for wedding advice, or telling her mother, or explaining it all to Aubrey. Said it was a quiet morning. After a beautiful night, she scolded herself. A lovely night! She had no business complaining about it. Annoyed with herself, she went back inside to pour the first cup of freshly brewed coffee. Then she began to chuckle. What had she been thinking of? This was easy to quit she was dealing with. Wasn't this the same man who waited by his own omission nearly a decade to decade to so much as kiss her at the rate he took things it could be another one before he brought up the subject of marriage <laughs> the only reason they moved from the first kiss to where they stood now was because she well she thrown herself at him grace admitted plain and simple and she wouldn't have had the guts to do it that if Anna hadn't shown her alone. Flowers, she thought, turned her so that she could smile at them, bright and pretty on her kitchen counter. Candlelight dinner, moonlight walks, and long, tender lovemaking. Yes, he was courting her, and would likely continue to do so until she went mad, waiting for him to take the next step. But that was Ethan, she admitted, just one of the things she adored about him. She sipped coffee, bit her lip. Why did he have to take the step? Why shouldn't she be the one to move things along. Julia told her main, men liked it when women took the initiative. And hadn't Ethan liked it when she finally worked up the courage to ask him to make love with her? She could do some courting herself, couldn't she? And she could move it along at a faster pace. God knew she was an expert at getting things done on schedule. It would only take the courage to ask him. 
peacefully without a breath. She'd have to find that, but she would dig inside herself until she did. Temperatures soared, their humidity thickened, and a serpent molasses that came not so cheerfully dubbed feminity. He worked bellow decks, trimming out the cabin until the heat seemed sent him topside, desperate fluids and one stingy breeze. Though he rarely complained about the working conditions, he's almost like cam, stripped to the waist, so I poured as he patiently varnished. It's gonna take a week to dry. It's so goddamn damp. Decent storm might blow some of it out. <laughs> then I wish to Christ we'd have one. Cam grabbed up the jug and glugged, jug and glugged water straight from the lip. Close weather makes some people edgy. I'm not edgy, I'm hot. Where's the kid? Send him for some ice. Good idea. I can take a bath in it. There's no fucking air down there. <laughs> he said nodded. Varnishing was a miserable enough job in this weather, but working below in the little cabin where even the big fans couldn't reach was probably keen to working in hell. I'm gonna switch off for a while. I can do my own goddamn job. <laughs> he said merely lifted his funny shoulder. Suit yourself. <laughs> Cam gritted his teeth, then he said, Okay, I'll measure you. The heat's from my brain. I keep wondering if that alley cat's going. God name his letter yet. <laughs> Ought to. I went out Tuesday as soon as the post office broke the holiday. It's Friday now. I know what day it is he didn't. <laughs> Disgusting can't slap sweat off his face. Are you worried a damn bit about it? <laughs> Wouldn't make any difference if I am or not. She'll do what she's going to do. His gaze flicked up to Cam's and was hard as a bunch of Then we'll handle it. Cam paced the deck, caught a whiff of air from the fans, paced back. I never could understand how you can stay so calm when things go to hell. Practice. He said, murmuring, kept on varnishing. Cam rolled his aching shoulders, drummed his fingers on his thigh. He had to think of something else where he'd go. Chris. How'd the big day go the other night? Well, no. Jesus, Ethan, do I have to get the pliers? <laughs> smile moved over Ethan's mouth. I had a nice dinner, drank some of that. Paul Fouché feels so wild about taste fine enough, but I don't see what the big fuss is about. So you get laid? <laughs> he said, flicked up another glance, took a cab's whack around and decided to take the question of the spirit. It was a, yeah. Did you? Entertain in the, if no, entertain if no cooler camp. You're back and said, damn, she's the best thing that ever happened to you. I don't just mean the sex, though. There's got to be part of what's perked you up around here lately. A woman fits you like the proverbial glove. <laughs> he's in paws. Scratch his belly. We're sweating that one. Why? Because he's rock steady, pretty as a picture. Patient as Job, and she's got enough humor about life to tickle ours out yours. I guess we'll be sprucing up the yard for another wedding before long. <laughs> he has his fingers tight on her. I'm not going to marry her, Cam. It was the tone, as much as the statement that made Cam's eyes narrow, quite despair. I guess I could be reading you wrong. I figured the way things were moving, you were serious about it. I am serious about grace. <laughs> about a lot of things. He dipped his breath again, watching the clean gold fans. Marriage isn't something I'm looking for. Ordinarily, Cam would have let a subject such as this drop. He'd have walked away from it with a shrug. Your business, brother. But he knew Ethan too well. Had loved him too long to walk away from the pain. He crossed by the rails for the face. I wasn't looking for it either, he remember. Scared the hell out of me. More than one that comes into your life. The woman. I scare you to let her go. I know what I'm doing. Dug in at the hills, looked didn't stop him. You always figure you do. I hope you're right this time. I sure as hope, hope this isn't some shit that goes back to the ghost-eyed kid mother mom and dad brought home one day. The one who used to wake up screaming and don't go over there, Cam. Don't you go over there either. Mom and dad did better by us than that. It's nothing to do with them. It is. It all has everything to do with them. Listen, he broke up with them out of the second room. Hey, this shit's already melting. Cam straight and scrawled over with sets out of a habit rather than he didn't I tell you to find an alternative word for shit. You say it, Seth pointed out, shifting the bag of ice. That's because that's besides the point. No, the routine set out the ice and was going Why? Because Anna's gonna have my ass if you keep it up, and if she has mine, pal, I'll have yours. Oh. Now I'm scared. You ought to be. They continued to bicker. He even continued the varnish, turning them out, tuning them out, concentrating on the job at hand. He locked his unhappiness away. End of chapter 16.